Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Farmers Weekly's Business Clinic Question Time. Um, I'm Susie Horn, Farmers Weekly's Business Editor. I grew up on farms in East Yorkshire and North Yorkshire, where my brothers are arable and sheep farmers. Thanks very much to everyone for joining the webinar and also to our panel for their time and expertise. So tonight we're going to hear about some typical family farm business structure issues and answer as many questions from the audience as possible. So I'll introduce our panel. First, we have Jonathan Payne, senior partner at law firm Thrings. Jonathan advises farmers and rural landowners on business and corporate matters, including mergers and acquisitions of farms and farming businesses, generational shifts and investment in farming and land, as well as diversification, along with advice to other food and drink businesses. Andrew Robinson is a partner and head of agriculture at Armstrong Watson Accountants. Andrew is a farmer's son from a large hill farm in North Cumbria. He regularly works on a friend's farm and concentrates in his, in his professional work on looking after and advising farming businesses and landed estates across the north of England and into the borders. Chris Dolly is a partner in Carter Jonas uh, in the firm's Winchester office in Hampshire. He advises a wide range of farm businesses and estates on management issues, including company partnerships, sole trader matters, um, as well as contract farming agreements and other types of farming and land holding arrangements. Freddie Braithwaite Exley is an account executive with Aplan Rural Insurance. Freddie works with farms and estates across England and Wales. He has a background in rural land management, so he understands the risks and the concerns in a wide range of rural businesses. Some of the areas we'll be covering, covering tonight have insurance implications which can be overlooked when uh, there's a big rush on to get a farm business reorganised. So uh, Freddie will be telling us about some of those and answering questions on them. So we're going to hear from each of uh, the panel for a few minutes about the type of advice they give to farmers. And then after the presentations, we'll open it up for discussion, tackle some of the questions that we've had in advance, along with the ones that uh, the audience um, put in during the session. So if you're an audience member, you can ask a legal, tax, farm management or insurance question at any time. If you type them into the box at the foot of your screen, then I can direct them to the panel. The webinar is expected to last for about an hour and a quarter, and then afterwards it will be available on demand. So anyone who's registered will get an email to let them know when the recording is ready for viewing. So let's go straight to our first speaker, which is Jonathan Payne, senior partner at law firm Thrings. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Susie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Susie mentioned, I'm a, a corporate lawyer, and amongst uh, other things that I do, I have a specialism in business structures, particularly in the agricultural sector. I think from a, a legal perspective, um, we have four basic structures, some of which are, are, we, we come across um, on a daily basis uh, in the sector. Sole traders, an, a, a, an individual often referred to as self-employed, owning the business in its entirety, simple, um, very little formality required, and often tax-effective. Tax uh, biggest disadvantage though, uh, the individual concerned um, has personal liability for all debts of the business. Second, and probably the most common structure we see, um, certainly in, in, in the farming community, are uh, farming partnerships, uh, very similar, in fact, to sole traders. Um, you just need two people to come together with a view to making a profit, and you've got a partnership. You don't need a written agreement, although there are good reasons to have a written agreement. Uh, and we're certainly finding at the moment that a number of the banks are liking to see written agreements. Um, without a written agreement, the relationship um, will be governed by a very old piece of, of legislation from 1890 called the Partnership Act, um, which, which does have some um, unfortunate consequences um, particularly if things go wrong in the partnership. Uh, pros and cons of partnerships are very much the same as sole trader. Um, they can be very tax effective 
um, they provide or, and can provide um, pretty well for succession and succession uh, planning. Uh, and, and the big disadvantage, again, is each of the partners is personally liable for all of the debts of the business. Uh, third structure that we, 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 we see, and again, we see quite a lot of these nowadays, particularly on larger farms and farms with complex arrangements, high-risk diversification projects, and that, those are limited liability companies, whether registered um, south of the border in England and Wales or north of the border in Scotland. Um, biggest advantage is no personal liability beyond uh, the share capital that you uh, put in. Um, but disadvantages, they require quite a bit of formality. Um, there's lots of information that has to go on a public available uh, record. Uh, which you don't have to have with uh, sole traders and uh, partnerships. Um, but the great advantage, no personal liability. Uh, and then we've got something called a limited liability partnership, which is a, a little bit of a, a mix, if you like, of partnerships and limited liability companies. Um, you, you have members or partners, and as long as you've got two, you can be a limited liability uh, partnership. Um, and you have the benefit, um, the same tax benefits as a, as a partnership, um, but um, you have limited liability. Your, your liability is limited to the capital that you put into the business. Um, a bit like companies, though, there's quite a lot of formality and everything is available on, on the public records. So those are the basic structures um, that you'll see, and most businesses uh, will fall into one or more of those. Uh, what we do get are much more complex arrangements where, for example, you take... Um, ownership of the land, the, the, the farm, uh, and put that in one vehicle. So you may have that um, in, a, in a husband and wife partnership. You may have a, a, a trading partnership with children involved who run the farm on a day-to-day -day basis. And you might have some diversification projects running in a little limited liability company uh, just to protect everybody against uh, any unforeseen liabilities. Trusts, again, are, are commonly used in, 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 in the, the farming context. Um, predominantly for tax planning purposes, and in particular, inheritance tax planning. So um, I, I, as a lawyer, I don't really do tax, and, and I'll definitely defer to Andrew on, on all matters tax related. Um, but, but suffice it to say that trusts, um, in some circumstances, are very useful, good ways of providing for succession and mitigating potential for inheritance tax. And finally, um, we, we see cooperatives, joint ventures, um, producer organisations and, and, and other structures um, that might just work in some scenarios. I, I think the one thing I would say uh, to everybody is if you're considering changing business structures or indeed considering changing the way in farm, you farm and the, the type of farm you are, pick up the phone to your trusted farm advisors um, and have a chat with them, whoever they are. Um, they'll have a great deal of, of experience in, in what's available and just as importantly, how complex some of them can and can't be to put in place. Some arrangements will take months to put in place. Um, others can be done relatively quickly, relatively inexpensively. 
I think that's it for me. That's great. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And I think, you know, you mentioned trusted advisors. It's a lot of these uh, reorganisations, restructuring them, very much a team effort and uh, takes takes input from lots of angles to get it right sometimes. OK, thank you very much. So we'll go straight to Andrew now to talk about some of the sort of tax and finance aspects of uh, business structures. Andrew. Thanks, Susie. Uh, and thanks to Jonathan there. That's... Um, it's taken my job a lot easier because it's taken a lot of the legal legalities out of them. So, yeah, as an agricultural accountant, we, we spend a lot of time looking at the correct business structure for, for what are ever changing businesses in, in the current climate. Uh, and as just been said, there are sort of four main types of trading um, entities that we see as described. Uh, the first being, as discussed, the sole trader, uh, which is a one person business as self-employed and will be taxed under income tax uh, legislation, nothing else. So income tax and national insurance, um, currently at 20% and 40%, depending on the profits, um, as there's been much uh, debate over the last four, six days, uh, that's dropping to 19, but um, effectively 20% income tax as a sole trader, uh, as long as your accounts produce the right taxable profit for the tax man, there is no other uh, legal requirements. As we see, there is, um, and it was stated earlier, the, the most common structure for farming businesses is um, the family or business partnership, where a number of self-employed sole trader individuals come together to trade uh, and own, potentially own assets as a partnership. Um, again, it is taxed under income tax and national insurance. You are taxed at the relevant rate of income tax on the taxable profits you make. Uh, and I know there's always many a question asked, what's the difference between my accounting profit and taxable profit? Well, that's probably for a different seminar, but each partner will be taxed at income tax and national insurance on their profits. They are allocated uh, and is divided to them but you were still self-employed. Uh, as was um, mentioned, there is the, what appears or what feels like a halfway house between partnerships and limited liability companies, which is the limited liability partnership, which has members rather than partners for some reason. Um, but that's just what they're entitled. But from an account, the accounts are much more onerous, as was uh, as was confirmed. There is a lot more disclosure and public information goes in them to um, get that limited liability. But from a tax purpose, they are described as being looked through. So what they do is they look through the limited liability and tax it like any other partnership. Um, so again, it's back to the relevant rate of income tax on the members share of profits. So all those three are relatively straightforward from a tax point of view, it's income tax on the taxable profit. Um, and I think it's key to just distinguish that it's on the taxable profit. It's not on the accounting profit. And it's not what a partner or sole trader draws out of the business as his own earnings, wage or living as it's sometimes called. It's really what the taxable profit is. We then go on to limited liabilities companies, the, 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 the just the traditional limited company where it is a separate legal entity entirely. Um, and as many of us are probably aware, the shareholders own the company and it, the, the value of it belongs to them and the directors run the company for the shareholders. Now, in many, many situations on farming, the shareholders and the directors are definitely common. Uh, they may be different, but there's often they are the same people. Companies um, pay tax on their taxable profits at 19%. And that is on pretty much whatever level of profits a company makes. So you can instantly see that if you've got a higher profit business, 
a company may be advantageous because it pays 19% right through instead of a potential uh, individual in a partnership or a sole trader paying the higher rates of income tax of 40%. So that, that's one of the things that often comes up. But the company pays carbon insurance tax. The, direct, the shareholders get a dividend, hopefully, uh, that's declared. They will be taxed income tax on that, but only on the value of the dividend. And if a direct, I think the, the biggest thing, the item that creates most discussion with companies is, and getting around the mindset that, that the words that we used before, they are formal. So you have to formally withdraw your earnings from a company. You can't just write yourself a check and treat it as drawings. Um, so your, your earnings have to come out as either a dividend if you're a shareholder or a salary uh, effectively, both of which are taxed income tax. So you have to bear that in mind if you want in a lot of money out of the company. But obviously, if you leave money in the company and don't take it out, you are not taxed on it. Hence, why companies can be very tax efficient at time. Um, trusts were mentioned. Uh, I would never say that trusts aren't used for the trading part of farming businesses, but it's fairly rare that there's actually a trade through them. But they are very popular for asset ownership or asset protection. Um, and we could probably have a, a, a webinar solely on trusts um, and the sort of the complications and, and the facts around them. But they're a separate legal entity that has somebody that put a set law that put the assets in. They have trustees that look after it and benefit, beneficiaries that benefit from it. Um, now, most trusts of, of the more modern trusts are discretionary trusts, um, which effectively pay income tax like sole traders do but at ma and partnerships do but at the higher rates unless you're a very small trust so there they may and often a very good method of uh getting assets into them tax free and protecting from inheritance tax and capital gains tax for the future uh good for protecting them and allow and protecting them for future generations um but there is some income tax charges in there so that's a very, uh, and I'm sure, or I'm, uh, well, no, I am definitely sure a lot of these uh, will be talked about more in the questions. Um, I think the first thing I would just sort of stress before I finish is that there isn't one size or one plan or one business structure fits all farming businesses uh, or diversified businesses. Everyone's different and what's right for one isn't right for another. Um, there's many things to consider. I've focused on the tax but my uh, colleagues on this call, fellow speakers, it's not just about tax, it's about protection. It's about how the cash flows will work, about your future plans, your succession will maybe alter your view on it. Uh, and I'm sure uh, my fellow speakers would, I think the biggest one piece of advice is try to keep it as simple as possible. Don't have um, loads of different entities in your structure just almost because it feel it feels right at the time take a longer view because often complicating it now means it becomes a nightmare to unwind in the future but i think that sort of summarizes the accounts and tax in a in a in a summary way uh, and i'll hand back to susie thanks andrew um so we we move straight on to uh, chris dolly at park carter jonas um and uh, chris that's all yours now. Thank you. Susie, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I have a fairly good perspective on what agriculture has been doing over a considerable period of time, having been in practice for a bit over 40 years. And uh, the drivers to change in agriculture have in themselves changed over that period. Um, we regularly see uh, heart searching going on in terms of succession and the direction business should be taken in. Um, but undoubtedly, the single most important thing in looking at farming structures is the objective of the client. Their objectives will take into account all sorts of things such as uh, capability, capital availability, the attitudes of the next generation, 
indeed, is there a next generation? Uh, succession is a, always a thorny subject. Um, the farming community are very resourceful, um, but they are always looking to uh, find ways to do things more efficiently, looking for ways to improve their profitability. And consequently, we have heard about the structures that might be in place in a company partnership or sole trader uh, way. But below that, there are the ways of delivering the actual hands on farming. And in each of those headline forms of trading, below it, you might have in hand farming with direct direct labor and machine machinery. You might have contract farming where the uh, on the ground stuff is delivered by a third party who are paid for that benefit or to do the, deliver that benefit um, either on a whole farm basis or a job by job basis. And increasingly, again, share farming is coming to the fore where two people are carrying on business, two or more people are carrying on business um, on the same piece of land and sharing the inputs and the gross output, but not the profit. Contracting generally requires that the contractor has sufficient capital to fund men and machinery. And they are largely guaranteed a, an income for providing the men and machinery, although that income may then be supplemented by a share of divisible surplus or some other mechanism. Conversely, share farming uh, requires less capital on the whole of the share farmer the person coming to onto the land, invited onto the land to jointly run a, well, to, to run a business in tandem. And those people can have relatively modest amounts of money at day one, and therefore take at the same time relatively modest uh, share of the gross output. But over time, uh, there is commonality of purpose. If a penny is spent by one and two pence spent by the other, they will get two thirds, one third proportions of the gross output, but that can shift over time and is a great mechanism, a great mechanism to bring youngsters into the farming world, which is something that I feel very strongly we all need to be um, parties to. I could illustrate that by, for example, uh, three cases I have dealt with recently. One, an 850 acre pure arable farm where two brothers have come to share farm with the owner and that is now in its second year and is proving extremely successful. Another example in the livestock world, um, we have an organic dairy farm having been established on a large estate by a late 30 year old um, who would not have had the opportunity to find a place to run such an operation and the estate take a parental view that they want uh, to encourage someone and give them the opportunity and already the shift of ownership, for example, of the cows is starting to move from a relatively modest share of the share operator to a growing share. And I think within probably two more years, we'll be at a 50 50 um, arrangement in the ownership of the cows. The third example, an organic beef and sheep uh, farm where the farm manager retired and again the owner was pleased to give the opportunity to a youngster, a relative youngster, early 30s, uh, to come in and take a share farming arrangement. And that again is going fantastically well. Um, so 
the current climate, which you might think is difficult, is providing opportunity. Um, there are always people wanting to give up, but not to dispose of their freehold ownership. They want to continue to trade. Um, a share farming or maybe a contract farming agreement can allow that without the need for them to continue to sit on the tractor. I think that's probably all I want to say as a, uh, a kickoff, but the headline to that is the objective of the parties is the crucial thing in determining the nature of the practical farming offering. Back to that's you. great. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to some of those issues in the questions. There's a few already. Um, and we'll move now to Freddie Braithwaite Exley from A Plan Rural. Freddie, um, I think sometimes some of the insurance aspects of these big changes can get overlooked so i'm sure you'll be able to give us the tips on what to remember to do in association with all the, the tax and the legal aspects and the practical ones thanks yeah sure thanks susie um good afternoon everyone and thank you so again susie for the introduction um uh welcome back to those that have seen me before as a reminder as to who i am and um uh, and a small introduction to those that haven't met me uh, my name is Freddie Braithwaite. Actually, I work as part of the APLAN Rural Team, um, delivering farm insurance for farmers little and large across the country. And um, between me and my wider team, or our wider team, um, we cover England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and Susie mentioned in my introduction that uh, whilst I've been a broker for a good few years now, uh, I actually had a former career as a land agent. Um, so I've been involved in buying insurance, the considerations that go with it. Uh, but also involved in the structures of, uh, of farms and um, the vehicles they come with, be it partnerships, limited companies, trusts, and um, any other vehicles that may come, charities and those sort of things, bits and pieces. So I've been involved in the insurance equation from both sides. Um, and what I wanted to do with uh, the, the few minutes I have with you now is, is to give you a couple of reminders of what uh, would have been useful to me then that I know now in my role as an insurance broker. Uh, and link that to the topic of farm structures and what you should be mindful of as you consider those changes. Um, now, before we get into that side of things, uh, it's worth considering uh, what insurance is there for, really, and why we buy it. Uh, because simply put, it's, it's a way of reducing risk. When you buy your insurance, you transfer the risk to an underwriter who, if, everything got, if everything's gone to plan and is brokered correctly, will cover the cost of a loss that is insured ultimately putting you back in a position that you were before the loss. And the reasons we buy insurances are to protect our people, our assets, our income streams, uh, and protect the futures of our business uh, from these unforeseeable and perhaps unplanned events. And it gives you the peace of mind to, to act with freedom and, and to run your businesses in the knowledge that if the worst comes to light, uh, you can get back on your feet quickly and effectively. And in today's economy and society, there are a multitude of uncertainties in the rural world going on. Uh, a lot of which were mentioned in the advert, the advert for this webinar, input, input costs running, volatile outputs, the future of subsidies, building costs is a big one for me and where those are going at the moment from an insurance perspective, uh, supply chain, it's just, dare I say, Brexit and energy prices. Jo God, what a joyous world we live in right, right now. <laughs> um, but uh, with these changes and uncertainties, we have... Um, seen an increase in sort of diversification. It's been a buzzword for well, forever, it seems like. But with the diversification comes the consideration of how you structure your business and how you run these, these new enterprises. And in, uh, in an earlier webinar uh, with Farmers Weekly, I advised that in the eyes of an insurer, diversification just equals change. And where there's change, you need to let your insurers know. Um, they like to be kept in the loop on these things so they can advise you on uh, where your exposures might come. And, and those exposures come whether the changes are little or large, and they can be quite significant of very small changes. Um, and what I thought I'd do is just do a really quick example of a very topical uh, change that we see um, all the time on lots and lots of farms, as well as it popped up in one of the questions as well, and that's change of use. Be that change of use from a farm building to let storage, office spaces, or holiday lets. And I'm gonna pose a whole lot of hypothetical questions 
Uh, and the idea is to get you thinking in the right right way. And forgive me if I don't answer those questions, but feel free to reach out and uh, we can discuss them. Okay, so you've got a farm building, you're gonna do work to it. Are you covered for the construction phase? Are you, res are you responsible for the project's insurance? Are you the project manager or is someone else managing it? Have you checked the buildings, the builders got their own insurances? You're checking who's liable for the loss if it's to occur. Assuming there's been some work done to the property, have you changed the sum insured? Have you changed the rebuild value? Have you added contents to it? Would it cost you more to replace it now than it did before the change of use? And now you're now generating an income from that building. I hope so. Do you want to protect that income? And if so, how long do you need to protect it for? Do you need just 12 months cover to get back on your feet and get the clientele back in there? Or do you need 24 months or 36 months? And in fact, is it still your responsibility to insure it once you've got it up and running? And for that matter, who's running it? And are they replaceable? Do you need cover for the employee that is that is running it? If they were to become incapacitated, would you have to find somebody else to do it while they're away? Are you providing services, water, electricity, heating? If those services fail to the business that you're letting the property to, are you responsible for the loss of income to their business? Now, in the majority of these instances I've just whistle stopped my way through um, a standard farm policy will extend to cover you provided you talk to your insurance broker about it and make sure they're aware of it and your insurer is subsequently aware of it but we've been see we've seen with these businesses expand masses over the last few years and as we start to talk about farm structures inevitably the businesses we're talking about are getting bigger and some of the liabilities and the risks that come with it may require their own policies so if we're to expand on that example does the holiday net holiday net now or the commercial office have its own website how are you storing your customers customers data are you exposed to cyber threats i'd argue that everybody is um but you may have seen actually that just this week the dales of farm shop was hacked with sensitive information being uh leaked on a number of high profile individuals and i'd be interested to know how many of you are considering cyber security on your own farms um how do you store your data is it uh, on a computer is it in the cloud do you back it up anywhere do you have dual forms of uh, access to these computers how safe really is it um, and for a matter of that to expand on that then again who owns the business and now we start to talk about the farm structures whether it's the individual that owns it does it still form part of the core farm or has it been set up in its own vehicle a separate business a limited company or in partnership with another entity and do you want liability to be on the farm policy or do you want it to stand stand alone with that company? Um, and as Jonathan mentioned earlier, liability keeps coming up in the conversations we've, we're talking about today. And, and, and in, it is a huge part of the conversation for good reason, because in some instances it's limited, but in other instances, the liability is totally unlimited. So with that, whilst the business might have their own liability insurance, you may might want to consider directors and officers insurance for the directors of the business. Do the trustees want their own indemnity insurance as well? And these covers might not necessarily have formed part of the insurance conversation you've had to date, um, but should certainly form part of the conversation that you have going forward. Um, and what are the legal ramifications with these structures? Do your, does your legal expenses insurance cover your personal liabilities um, or your personal legal expenses? Does it now extend to extend to from a commercial expenses? Now, in all of what I've said, it's not to worry you, uh, but it's to remind you of my second piece of advice, which is that your insurance broker works for you. I think it's sometimes forgotten that we're uh, not just here to sell you something, but you should always remember that your broker, you're your broker's client, uh, and they're always they're always working with your best intentions. Uh, they're there not only to find you the right cover, but to give you the right price and to give you the right advice on what cover is available and what exposures you might have. And I think that's what, what often makes the difference between a good broker and a great broker. Um, so just before you crack on with uh, starting your new venture or overhauling the structure of your entire farm, uh, I'll reiterate some of the points already made is uh, get in touch with your advisor, pick up the phone, email us, arrange a Zoom meeting. We do these webinars and we are digitally collected brilliantly simply these days. So it's very easy to have that conversation before it starts, uh, which is much easier for us to arrange cover for you uh, if we hear about it and know about it before you're midway through it. Um, no, matter, no matter what the question is, uh, we'll be able to explore, explore options uh, and advise you on what cover is and sometimes isn't available, but 
as a bottom line, we should be able to give you a bit of peace of mind uh, as we enter into this wonderfully changing world that we seem to find ourselves in. Okay, thanks very much, Freddie. Um, lots to go on there. Um, so we will go straight to our first question. And really, a, a lot of it has been covered. Um, and it's basically, should I be a sole trader or a company? Um, I mean, both Andrew and Jonathan covered a lot of that. But I wonder if either of you could perhaps speak very briefly on what what might be misunderstood about moving to most misunderstood about moving to a company you know, are there responsibilities or liabilities that, that people perhaps don't appreciate because it doesn't cost um, and also the costs um perhaps you could say andrew what the additional costs of operating as a company might be on an annual basis uh, just in terms of the the reporting and the extra um requirements go to andrew first and then uh Jonathan. yeah i think um there's a lot to consider if you're wanting to move from a sole trader to a to a limited company um and I th the question you sort of pose is, is the extra costs and even with the new financial reporting standards that company accounts have to comply with they are still a lot more onerous regulations than filling than completing your, your sole trader self-employed accounts that as i stated before as long as they follow a sort of relatively sensible format and come out with the right profit or loss at the bottom and the tax HMRC is happy with them, that's their only legal responsibility. Where a company set of accounts, the accounts have to be laid out in FRS, Financial Reporting Standards and Companies Act format. There isn't a choice. Um, and therefore, there is, there's more cost of uh, the, the client, the company maintaining that information. There's more cost of producing and submitting those accounts, uh, which then become uh, a public document. So I think um, there is extra hassle, extra public documents, extra cost, um, which ha should be borne in mind. Um, and just going sort of back just to the original question, I think unless there was some very valid other reason that Jonathan perhaps talks about that you want to protect assets or protect against an unknown liability, unless your business was making 50,000 profit or more, you wouldn't go into a limited company just for tax saving. Mm -hmm. um, it just wouldn't, the, the extra cost would outweigh the, the minor tax saving. If, you, if, you, if your business is above that, it's a different thing, but, but you mm -hmm. may have a, a different valid reason, a legal reason, a protection issue to go into the limited company that outweighs the extra cost. Yeah, okay, thank you. Jonathan, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I think Andrew's really hit the nail on the head there. It, it, take, take a look at the size of the operation. What, what, what size is it running at at, at, at the moment? What, what are the realistic aspirations for the business? Um, it, it, if it's likely to stay um, at that sort of... 50,000 or less, it, you, you definitely wouldn't want to be um, considering a shift from sole trader to, to, to limited liability. Um, when you get to about that 50,000 mark, um, really it, it, the, 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 the potential benefits of um, limitation of, of liability um, probably set in the context of, of, of the, the current tax regimes would, would potentially make limited liability status a, 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 an option. Okay, thank you. All right, the next one, uh, yeah, this one, um, some of these questions can be put very simply, but um, the answers it depends, you know, as long as a piece of string. What's the most tax efficient way to sell my farm? Um, uh, Andrew, I think we'll, we'll go to you on that one as well. That, that one seems, yeah, um, it, it isn't as simple as that. I think yeah. when you sell your farm, you're undoubtedly, there is only one tax that's going to 
come into play um, in in this sort of conversation. That's capital gains tax, yeah. and yeah. all farms land. If it's been owned a period of time, will have a capital gain in there. It'll be worth more than it's bought for. Mm -hmm. So there will be a capital gain to calculate, and then look at what the tax will be. And I think where you can make that more efficient is see whether you can reduce the capital gain from the capital gains rate of tax from 20% to 10% if you are able to claim business asset disposal relief. Many people will have heard about it when it was called entrepreneur's relief, which many of us still slip into, but it, it was called business asset disposal relief that effectively uh, is a relief that reduces the rate by 10% or down to 10%, if you sell the whole a substantial part of a business asset or a business, so cease the business. So in this question, we're presuming they're selling the whole farm. If they cease farming and qualify for business asset disposal relief, the first million pound per owner of gain will be taxed 10%, anything over that will be 20%. So I think the first way to make it as efficient as possible is see or make sure you qualify for that relief because it's not just straightforward. Or mm -hmm. if you, you know if you keep trading in a small way, you might jeopardise that. I suppose what you do with the proceeds after you've sold the farm could make it more could be classed as an efficiency if you were to sell your farm and just put the money in the bank. You would pay your tax. If you were to sell the farm and buy another qualifying business asset, land and property, somewhere else, you may be able to qualify for rollover relief. Um, so rollover relief, it's a bit like kicking the tax down, the can down the road. You will, the tax will be to pay when you sell the asset you've just rolled into. But I think the key efficiencies is getting business asset disposal relief, making sure all the owners qualify for that, for, for their million pound, um, and make sure you do. I think that's the key. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on that. I mean, it was fairly strictly a tax question. Right, okay, we'll move on to the next one then. But another big question. What? Um, it is structural, but um, and unfortunately fairly common. What should one do when a partnership breaks down? Um, I think we'll go to you on that one, Jonathan. Obviously, there are there are ways and lots of ways in the, in which this can happen. Sometimes it happens suddenly. Sometimes it's a sort of gradual process and uh, things get very difficult. And the point at which people call in the lawyers and say, what, what should we do? Um, I'm sure that's probably something you're familiar with, Jonathan. Absolutely, uh, Susie. I think, um, I, th I think, I think my first advice is if, if, if you've got a partnership and the, the the relationship between the partners is starting to break down. Um, take advice at an early stage, uh, not necessarily from your uh, from your your lawyer, but but from uh, other trusted farm advisors, um, your land agent, your accountants. Um, they may well have good practical advice on how you may. Um, resolve issues that have arisen between um, between partners. Um, the one thing I would always say to try and avoid doing is, is taking entrenched positions because as soon as you push yourself into an entrenched position, it becomes very, very difficult to, res to resolve the problem. And ultimately, if you can't resolve the problem, if you can't uh, mend the issue or come to some acceptable uh, resolution, be it one partner buying another partner out, um, then the Partnership Act will step in. The Partnership Agreement might also step in and you may end up having to sell the farm, um, liquidate the assets and uh, distribute them to the partners. Mm. Right. Thank you. Chris, I don't know whether you've perhaps had experience, I'm sure you've had experience of this, but I mean, 
have you been able to help people see you know when things become entrenched as Jonathan just said have you got examples where you've been able to sort of unpick that and perhaps see a way through um that, that the the individuals involved perhaps can't see because of the way things have developed um yes susie it's um it sadly happens more often than it should because people do exactly that they become entrenched um and it's often the case where there aren't formal partners meetings um that things are openly and properly discussed at in and indeed minuted mm. um and all the time things are going well uh of course you can do without those uh without detriment to the business or individuals but it all tends to start with um the sort of philosophy that you should have a written partnership agreement that is well crafted well considered and at the time it's entered into ensure there are appropriate provisions for when things get tough um, having said that, I'm a, I'm a great believer in doing that and then putting it in the drawer and hopefully you don't need to look at it too often. But that can be a great source of um, a way to help resolution when there is difficulty and uh, encouraging discussion and talking and um, quite often I'm asked to sit in the middle and have the wisdom of Solomon which um can be a good thing providing both parties or there might be three four five parties are prepared to be open-minded um if they're not then ultimately um, some form of mediation uh mm -hmm. i've used that very successfully to get to a point where there might be resolution where there wouldn't have been resolution um, and ultimately, I always think that if we get to a point where there has to be litigation between partners, then everybody's failed a little bit um, because there, there is genu gen generally an answer to whatever is causing the friction. Um, and at any one time, I would say I've got two or three uh, businesses where I will have been called into often having never been involved before um, to take a dispassionate view and to to try and mend the bridges at least sufficiently that there can be a managed parting of the waves rather than an acrimonious parting of the waves so discussion 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 I can't emphasize that enough mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much um, so our next question uh, I think it was Jonathan in his uh, presentation mentioned um, sometimes quite complex diversifications. This is from someone who hasn't started any diversification yet, but she's, they are thinking about perhaps a dog walking field, a cattery, a campsite, either temporary or permanent cafe or holiday cottage conversion. Um, and just asking, not asking what's the best option, but um, asking would it be best to have a limit to have diversification as a limited company alongside and separate to the farm business um or to, to keep them as sole traders which i assume that the farm is at, at the moment um and so we'll go to um we'll go to both andrew and jonathan on that but also come in with a uh, an insurance angle at the end uh, to freddie which is um, what about the question and cost of public liability insurance? Um, is that more relevant than the structure? Um, should you have one trading structure and one insurance or lots of different trades and, and different covers? Um, so if you hold back on that one for now, Freddie, and we'll go to, um, we'll go to Jonathan first on the question of wh whether it should be within the farm business or separate operation. I, I, I think if, if you were only going to uh, pick uh, one or two of the uh, potential diversification projects, you'd probably um, leave them in the same trading entity as, as currently um, running the farm. So if, if it's a sole trader, um, I, I would carry on as a sole trade, but... 
if you're going to do all of those things and you're going to do them um, moderately well, um, ultimately a limited liability company may well be uh, a better option for those projects. Right, thank but you. One limited liability company, um, I think, I think some, somebody in the introductions quite rightly pointed out it, it, you can make things far too complex. Uh, and I have seen farms with separate limited liability companies for each diversification project um, without mm. any real need. Uh, you just multiply costs um, and gain very little. Okay, thank you. Um, just really quickly to Andrew on that one. I mean, I guess most people have mentioned succession one way or another, and um, I wondered whether there might be a tendency to think if, if there are several family members and a new generation coming in, making a separate business would give perhaps someone in succession perhaps a, a you know more responsibility more ownership of, of a, an enterprise but that from from what jonathan's just said that that may be really a, a, a mistake and just trying to sort of make somebody feel better rather than being the most sensible decision in the circumstances yeah i think jonathan summed it up i think um just quickly i think you've got to consider it's not just about tax it's not just about counts um I'm sure Freddie will be able to support this in the minute. One, as soon as the public are mentioned and you're bringing public onto your farm, my view on liabilities is they always go up somewhat, But so you need to insure it. But I think my abiding would think I would start it as a sole trader. And, and the reason I would do that, I think most businesses that don't have a, a real risk in them or an uninsurable risk um, liability is start as a sole trader because you can always incorporate into a limited company. That's a relative. It, it's it's a, it's a strict process you follow, but it's relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Coming back the other way, when you've gone into a limited company and wished you hadn't, so disincorporating is far more complicated. So I think I would always say, unless it's real valid, start as the sole trader of the partnership. You can always go to a company when it takes off. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Freddie, if you want to come in there on the on the insurance and particularly obviously the, the liability angle, public liability angle for diversifications. Yeah, sure. And actually, just to echo the points that Jonathan and Andrew have already made, is uh, insurance is trying to make things simple. I know which people will often say is not the case when insurance is far too complicated, but they have tried to make it as simple as possible. I mentioned it in the introduction that diversification uh, in any form is, 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 is not a new concept to the rural uh, farming industry. Uh, and things like dog fields, uh, a cattery, campsites, a holiday lets, because these are increasingly more common, um, the farm policies that we see, the, the, the general farm, the standard farm policies we see have been built to uh, take on board these, these risks and liabilities. Most of those, those risks can be incorporated in a standard policy. Um, and as Andrew was mentioning then, whenever you start getting the public involved, the question of liability is one that should be dinging off in your, in your head. Um, uh, and as I say, Getting the right level of liability cover is is essential, and 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 when, and when you think about what level you want, it's uh, very dependent on who that is coming on. Is it young people coming on to use an activity park, or is it um, is it only a few people coming on at, at older ages? It, it, think think about the demographic of people that are coming onto the farm, and how many people. Right. Thank you, Freddie. Um, we will go to uh, a lot of tax questions. Um, Yeah, this one is uh, wanting to pass the farm on to their daughter, avoiding any tax implications. The farm's main income is not from farming, but from uh, industrial units, which I presume are rented out. So that's a that's a straight tax one for Andrew. Uh, thank you for that one. Um, yeah, um, passing assets on to the next generation tax free um, isn't. It's very straightforward in terms of a. Uh, doing it, but it's less straightforward in the tax, and, and especially in terms of that question. So you would look at, the, there's obviously from, we're presuming there's some farming assets that are being farmed, um, but there's some 
let industrial commercial properties that are being let so we have two types of assets we have assets that are being used in a trade and business i.e the farm land which uh, could be gifted over to the next generation and because it's a business asset business land and property the capital gain that is inherent in there that is its increase in value can be held over to the to the daughter and it would only ever come out for the daughter sold the land the let properties aren't being used within a business letting properties does not qualify as a trade in business for holdover capital gains holdover so if those assets were handed over to their daughter their the parents in the, this question would have a capital gains tax liability if presuming there's a capital gain and it's above the allowances which i think is a fairly sensible presumption then depending on property values property ownership you may be able to um see if you could spread them out over a number of years the gift and use the capital gain allowances or you may be able to consider looking at a trust to get them to the next generation more tax efficiently but yeah it, it i think when you're looking at succession plan and handed a gifts you've always got to watch it's a great question that for this webinar because you've got to watch those non fat those non-business assets that are you know the cottage at the end of the road that's let out or the the livery yard and these sorts of things that can just catch you out okay thank you um right i think we'll uh we've got one for i think this is one best directed to chris um we have a small old hill farm on exmoor it's really well positioned for conservation-based agriculture it's not on a huge scale we want to keep it intact so it doesn't get broken up by a future owner. Uh, so we're trying to find income streams to develop the farm so that it can pay its way. Um, any discussion around this um, would be very helpful. And basically, they're asking for ideas, Chris, um, in terms of how, how they might keep their farm going and keep it intact um, and be sustainable. But obviously profitable to some extent as well. Um, thank you. Um, the first question that you always have to ask is what business opportunities are uh, available that would be unique to that location? Um, because they are the ones that are probably going to give you the best chance of establishing a successful business. So you could uh, for example, look at something that could be done on a trading estate on the edge of Exeter or wherever, um, or businesses that suit Exmoor. Um, and some things that could be do done on the edge of Exeter could also suit Exmoor. But, but what is going to cause people to come to that business? Um, and that may be classically tourism, but you have to have the aptitude and you have to be prepared to have people uh, around you, which doesn't suit everybody. Mm. And it's quite different inviting people onto your hallowed uh, spot, beauty spot in deepest, darkest England uh, and sharing it than farming there on your own. But um, there, is no, uh, there is no secret to identifying the business. I mean, they, they come into various categories. They are people businesses. They are businesses that might operate on the internet. Uh, there is grant-led um, income and there is farming income. Uh, the nature of the individual who owns and aspires to run that business is so important. If you're... Um, if you have the business acumen and market acumen and the capital, then uh, you have a chance of establishing a particular a particular business. But but what the nature of that business might be, um, you could. Uh, we we've just heard about setting up a a dog field, for example. But you need a certain amount of people and the market research to determine 
whether that is sufficiently in demand in the area. Um, there has been a flight to glamping and wild camping. The question is, in your particular area, is that now oversupplied? Because we saw last summer when the period that you could do without planning consent, in other words, under permitted mm -hmm. development, was doubled. Yeah. Um, people made a bit of money, not huge amounts, because even on 56 days, uh, there's a lot of setup costs. This year we're back to 28. Um, I was with a client the other day who was saying they reckon they'd made 560 pounds out of their camping season. Uh, mm -hmm. as they described it, beer money. It was better than not making £560. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all about capability, demand, and have you got the capital to set it up, mm -hmm. which is usually the most difficult thing for an already small business to take mm -hmm. that next step. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying in your, your examples of share farming, um, it might be something where if, if the skills or the aptitude aren't there, but the, the desire is there to to make something of it, then yes. it might provide an opportunity for somebody to come in to run the yes. little oh, business sorry. that, um, that uh, excuse me, that, uh, that was an unexpected interruption. Um, no, I that, agree entirely. And I could illustrate that by um, uh, one of my clients, we set up a wedding venue uh, but they had no experience in providing the catering mm -hmm. and we brought a share caterer in mm -hmm. on exactly the same basis if it was a share arable farmer or a share livestock farmer we had a share caterer and that mm -hmm. worked extremely well so i agree that is a way forward yeah. okay thank you um we'll so, go to an inch yeah sorry freddie did I, you want to I, come I, in on that yeah, I'll just add to it because it's a, a neat example of where insurance can can do a lot of it can help a lot when you've got a, as you, you described it as a, a small hill farm in, in Exmoor, um, where the underlying assets uh, would be far outweighed by the potential liability of having people coming onto a farm, mm -hmm. having insurance in place, is, it's, a, it's a really good example of where having the right cover can give you peace of mind that if it does go wrong or where, where things start to, where you start to incur costs unexpectedly or, or there is a liability claim that comes about, the insurance is there to cover it rather than the underlying assets of, the, of a farm, um, which wouldn't come close to, to, to covering some of these larger claims that can come about. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it just, and we talked, and you talked about the liability of, or Chris did about sharing catering, where you don't necessarily have the expertise in a particular field. Insurers understandably get a little nervous about when you say, I've never done it before, it's my first time trying where you can bring in and show that you've thought about the risks in a basic risk assessment, what you're doing, but where you've thought about the potential exposures in your business model, um, insurers are very open to this conversation and saying, these are the risks I force, uh, perceive, this is what I've done to mitigate them, but I, I'd like to buy insurance for the ones that I can't foresee and, and, and can't predict. Um, and that's part of being an insurance broker, that's part of what insurance is there for, it's to, it's to give you the freedom to try these uh, try these diversifications and projects um, on on such farms. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to a, a direct um, insurance question. It's on um, public liability. Um, somebody's asking, what's the optimum third party cover, given that their land, including woodland, includes areas with public access. Their concern is being sued by a member of the public or guests at their holiday cottage in the event of a hypothetical case of serious injury. So, you see, um, anything can happen, and I'm sure from your experience, Freddie, it does. Um, it, I mean, in terms of optimum third party insurance, I guess that's a, a question of thinking across the board about what might happen and how you can mitigate those risks and then how much cover to take. Yeah, sure. I mean, the political answer is to say it's, it depends. Yeah. Um, but to give you some steer and to answer the question and, and give a fair, fair response is um, even in, in my relatively short career of whatever it is, 10 years in the industry, um, we've seen a standard farm limit of indemnity go from a couple of million to five to, to 10 million. I don't see anybody that buys less than 10 million pounds worth of public, uh, public liability 
uh, insurance. Um, but some of you may be aware of something called the Ogden rates. Um, they changed, I think I said five or six years ago, they changed in such a way that a claim uh, pre-change that might have come might have come to the region of five to 10 million is now looking like it's potentially in the 20 to 30 million pound range um, in settlement. The difficulty is, is that we haven't seen any real life cases in that bracket yet, but the basic maths is that a claim like that to come to light is very reasonable, very, very possible. Um, and to look at it in, in, in slightly, a, a cr not crude the wrong word, but in a, in a really simple way and in a blunt way is that the cost of uh, lifetime support for young people um, is going to far outweigh the costs of, say, a death of an older, uh, an older person. Uh, and whilst that is harsh to, uh, different, blunt, um, that's the way these compensations are worked out. So if you've got young people in their masses coming onto a farm, um, your, your, your liabilities are far greater than if you've got just an individual working on a farm um, late in, later in their life. Um, uh, and that, that's what you have to, to slightly think about when you're entering into these diversification projects and you're, you're, you're setting your limit of indemnity. What, what gives you peace of mind that if something went wrong, I'm going to be covered in full? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, I did, um, I, of course, I didn't say, so between 10 and 30, 10 is an absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. but, but really consider buying that extra 10 mm -hmm. to top it up to 20 and even 30 if you've got um, high profile individuals or if you've got uh, young coming onto the farm. Yeah, I know it's going to depend on all sorts of things, but in terms roughly of the difference between the cost of 10 million of cover and 30 million, what, what sort of difference would you be looking at? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. We're talking about massive sums of money now. Um, and in my opinion, as insurance broker, it's, it's very reasonable. So, I mean, if I was going to give you a really indicative price, I'm going to say it's roughly an extra five to six, five to seven hundred pounds for an extra ten million pounds worth of cover, plus income tax. Mm -hmm. That's what income tax, insurance premium tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to be covered really, really well. <laughs> yeah. Um. Chris, can I just come to you on a sort of general insurance question? You, you'll be dealing with lots of farms and estates of different sizes. And in terms generally of the, the issues that arrive, arise regarding insurance, what, what would you say the most common things are um, that, that you have to advise on that, that are to do with insurance other than just a, a simple sort of annual review? Um, well, I, I, I think that... Uh, the things that people are particularly worried about at the moment are the liability type things, uh, and particularly mm -hmm. relating, for example, to the risks around trees falling with the changing uh, environment that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I think health and safety is a really big issue and, and the farming community are working really hard on keeping their staff safe uh, but nonetheless when i'm on farm they want to have a discussion around how they should be protecting themselves if the worst should happen and of course you can't ensure yourself uh subject to what freddie may say against Ill Ill illegality so um um but you can ensure yourself or your staff against proper accidents as it were um <laughs> So, so I think the liability in the context of health and safety is is mm -hmm. very uppermost in people's minds. Thank you. Um, so we can, can I add one? Whilst we're just talking about insurance and things to be very mindful of at the moment, liability has always been one of the big ones, and I echo what Chris is saying. It's, it still remains one, but just currently in this in in the environment that we're in at the moment, building cost is one I strongly urge everybody to have a think mm -hmm. about because yeah. it's a liability that is inadvertently crept up on us all over the last 24 months. Yeah. And as okay. much as we may do our annual review and say, oh, that's about right for our building sums insured, mm -hmm. and we'll index link it this 5, 10, 15% we're being advised. But in reality, we, we've all seen that to, to, to create new or to build new farm buildings and to, to repair farm buildings, in, in some instances, those costs have gone significantly higher than that and it's that is a liability in itself to be mindful of 
being underinsured. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, uh, we've we've actually got um, quite a few questions on trusts. I'll, I'll try and sort of roll them together a little bit, if possible, because we're, we're coming up to time. Um, one of them is, so I guess we'll go to Jonathan first and then Andrew on these. What are the pitfalls of holding farm business assets, land, commercial and resen re residential property in a discretionary trust? Um, what happens when a non-farming beneficiary of a trust wants their funds out? Does it collapse the trust or is it all up to the trustees? Um, and then there's another one about querying whether discretionary trusts are taxed on their net capital value every 10 years. Um, and can that be avoided? So sort of, sorry, apologise, lots of aspects in there, but trusts are obviously something that, that the people are um, either concerned about or interested in. So, Jonathan, um, just could you make some? You did refer briefly to trust in your um, in your introduction, but if you could, um, you won't have time perhaps to answer all of those, but just make some general points about the use of trusts. And, and yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Susie. Um, I have to say to start off with, I'm not a trust expert, and, and the answer to um, a lot of the questions will be down to. Um, what exactly the terms of the trust say. So the person who's potentially wanting to exit a trust, you, you, you really need to go away and read the terms of the, the, the trust deed. Uh, it depends on the type of the trust. Uh, and, and you will most certainly need to take advice as to the effect yeah. of exiting the trust, uh, whether that triggers any... Uh, tax consequences, etc. Um, as I say, trusts are, are, are generally used in relation, to, in, in, in the holding of the um, farming asset rather than the actual day-to-day -day, um, operation of the farm. Um, generally tax-driven, um, and Andrew may well um, certainly be able to answer that that last question on on um, the 10-year recurring tax charge. Yeah. Okay, if we go quickly to you on that one, Andrew. Yeah, we've saved the best questions to last on trust, but I think well, the, the, the end bit... Um, What's been referred to on the on the lifetime tax charge is the ten year tax uh, tax regime that's been brought in for trust. So there's a every trust has its own ten year anniversary from when the assets went in, and it, and it's effectively uh, linked to inheritance tax. Um, and the assets in the trust are looked at every ten years. What have they gone up? Do they qualify for any inheritance tax reliefs? And if they don't, there's a tax charge levied on on the increase i think on this sort of webinar where the lion's share and, and that there'll be many other assets but the lion's share of the assets in trusts in these examples are land a farm land and property that would, would qualify for agricultural property relief for inheritance tax therefore wouldn't be a problem the 10-year charge calculation would still be to do but it wouldn't be a levy okay. um thank you yeah and i think that jonathan summed up some of the other points Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try and fit in one last. Susie, question. I just add two, two, two quick comments on the one. Very quick, please, Freddie, because I'm trying yeah, to find really another, another last with, question. With with trust, just generally speaking, just be mindful of setting up trustee indemnity insurance for the individuals that are your trustees. Historically, people did it as a quite often as a favour to be a trustee for whatever it might be, but actually, there's a huge amount of liability that comes with being a trustee. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and having right. that indemnity cover in place is 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 massively advised. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. I might get my knuckles wrapped, but we'll try and do a quick last question um, with Chris. Um, how do you see the current variability in costs affecting prospective new entrants to the industry? It's structural in a way because we we need new entrants, and it's very difficult for them to get there. Yeah, we, we, we do. And, and of course, the really important thing in terms of new entrants being able to come in is profitability. And whilst we see costs rising hugely, um, there are still sectors of agriculture where there are decent profits being made, 
um, arable property is the prime example of that. And what I would call the hands-on sheep uh, running a, a sheep flock. Um, and it comes back a little bit to share farming, I think is a fantastic mm -hmm. way that the borrowing power of the landowner share farmer can be leveraged to ensure opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the point I really want to get over. A resourcefulness, there are ways forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Right, well, that's a, a, a hopeful note on which to end. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, we have so many questions that we haven't been able to answer, so apologies to the audience and people who bothered to put in their questions. The panel, some, the panel will try and answer some of them directly. Um, they'll be passed on, on to the, the panel, the appropriate panel member. And um, we may try and answer some of them in Farmers Weekly's Business Clinic, um, which appears in the last issue of every month with readers' questions and answers. So just once again, thanks for joining. Thanks to the panel. And um, I hope the webinar has been useful in terms of your own farm businesses and giving you some, some pointers and ways forward. Thanks very much, everybody.